everyone. Thank you so much for uh, for coming on today. Uh, so we've got Adam, Don, and Justin from Happy Camper Capital. So essentially, they're investing in campgrounds. So they have a, an interesting product. I've got a chance to know them over the last few months, and I figured you know may as well uh, bring them on to our network and uh, introduce what they're doing in the U.S. So I'll let them take over. I am, and I'll let uh, Justin also uh, come on board here. All right, well, let's jump in. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, we are Happy Camper Capital. I'm Adam Lundy. Uh, Justin Hoggett is one of the co-founders. Um, and of course, Don Spafford, who's with us, is part of our executive team as well. Um, you know, we'd like to, I guess, get, give you guys a chance to get to know us and a little bit about what we do. Um, so before we jump into Death by PowerPoint, which I've prepared for you guys, um, kind of give you a little bit of background in us and, of course, you know, why it is we do what we do. Um, this is, you know, I, I think for us, a, a passion project, uh, you know, turned into something a little bigger. Um, you know, this was an idea that was spawned by, you know, my co-founder, Justin Hoggett. Uh, he, he was pushing the idea on me for a while before I actually took time to listen and look into these, this asset class. Uh, you know, it, it was, he was coming out of multifamily off a pretty, pretty bad run with all the uh, COVID restrictions we had here in the States. And it was just about the right time for me to listen. So I got looking into these. And of course, one of the things where your eyes pop out kind of once you start looking at the, the performance and the potential of these properties and, you know, all the different revenue centers you have. So um, turn, turn from something that we just wanted to buy a couple campgrounds at first for us and, you know, own with our families into, of course, being the big thinkers we are, you know, how can we bring a lot of people into this and, uh, you know, buy 100 properties. So that quickly became our goal is to get 100 properties in our portfolio. Uh, you know, we're, we've made a start in that direction. We've still got a long ways to go. Um, but we figured we'd share with you kind of what we learned along the way. So I'll give uh, Justin and Don a chance to introduce themselves and we'll, we'll jump in from there. Okay. I guess I'll take the reins uh, second man up. So Justin Hoggett, uh, based out of Denver. I've been in Denver for 14 years now and um, started in single family, took the uh, typical approach to what most investors take is single family into multifamily. And uh, and then like Adam said, jumped into the uh, RV park world. And a little bit of my history is, um, you know, I, I, took, I took a trip about five years ago on the road for a year, did a uh, year on the road with my family in our fifth wheel. Um, we actually, I say, moved into our latest, the, the latest home at the time. We did, started with the travel trailer. It was a little bit small, moved into a fifth wheel. And uh, during all that time, I, I really took the approach of like, I wonder if I can make this work and uh, really started analyzing deals and uh, opportunities on the road, uh, making offers in parks, uh, on parks in Colorado as I uh, planned on returning and um, ultimately decided to not forgo that at the time into more multifamily at the time. And then, um, and then, yeah, so the last couple of years we've been focused on the RV industry and Adam and I met uh, by paragliding, having a good time. Families uh, were basically identical. It seemed like kids about the same age, German Shepherd dogs, uh, same interests and, um, and, and of course camping. So, uh, this is a passion project of ours. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we'll mention probably later too is, is a opportunity to enjoy the investment in which we partake in. And most other options that you participate in out there, you cannot touch it, see it, feel it, you know, and this is one of those things that we just got super excited about and uh, not just in the cash flow potential, but also uh, being able to travel the country and stay in our own parks. So uh, would be, I'll open it up later uh, for all of us, you know, for questions, but uh, Don, tell us about yourself. All right, thanks guys. Yeah, hey everybody, uh, my name is Don Spafford. I think most people here probably knows me from what I can see on the screen, my, um, well, my view, but uh, yeah, I live in Idaho, uh, not, so Adam and Justin are both in, in Colorado. I'm kind of next door in, in Idaho. I'm about an hour and a half away from Yellowstone Park and uh, uh, Teton Mountains. Um, so very high camping area. Uh, I grew up most of my life in Nebraska, though, um, which still had a lot of people out camping. So, you know, camping is pretty much everywhere. It's, it's not a certain type of people that, that do it. Everybody does it um, just at different levels, I guess. Um, so my my background has more been in, uh, you know, unlike Justin and Adam, I actually started multifamily. Um, I went straight into the small multifamily and, and started getting into bigger commercial deals and 
uh, working towards the, the larger you know, multifamily syndications. Um, and then over the last couple of years, just having so much difficulty finding what I consider a, a great deal. Um, you know, and, and just for my own personal, I guess, uh, I don't know, morals or, or whatever it may be that, uh, you know, I, I always felt bad <laughs> to raise rents on, on people and uh, have to go through evictions and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I started looking for something better out there and uh, I came across uh, Adam, I think I met on maybe LinkedIn or, or something and um, we, we just connected and talked about what we were looking to do. And I, I just myself had, had discovered campgrounds as an investment option about a year ago and it was getting more to that space. It's kind of how I, I came across Adam and um, I, uh, you know, I liked a lot what they were doing. I liked their their level of integrity and, uh, you know, how they they were themselves were, were passionate about uh, about investing in campgrounds. And the more I learned about it myself and got more involved with it, um, you know, I, I saw this as, as a great potential and great opportunity to to get in at a very early phase of, of what I, I think is about to really explode overall for for people to invest in. Um, and I see, you know, our our team, Happy Camp Capital, is being the leaders of that space. Um, and that's kind of really what what uh, drove me to to uh, really get involved with these guys and, and uh, help take it to the next level. Perfect. All right, guys, uh, I will pull up the screen share here. We'll see if we can make this work properly and go from there. Uh, can I get a thumbs up for screen shares working? Yeah, man, you're good. All right, you're awesome. Great. Well, I want to share a little bit with you guys about how we operate. Um, so we are a sponsor operator uh, to the extreme. I like to say because. Uh, running a campground is a heck of a lot different than running a multifamily or an office building. Um, it's hospitality. It's a lot more involved, a lot of moving parts to it. Um, we realized getting into the space, there weren't, um, there weren't really significant systems set up in place for uh, national campground management. Um, there are large franchise brands um, in the States, uh, such as, you know, KOA and Jellystone. However, they don't provide management services. They provide branding and, you know, you more or less get to fly their flag. Um, so, you know, we knew it was going to be crucial early on for our model in these properties that are, you know, heavy uh, human resources um, assets that we were going to need to um, have a management structure in place. So before we bought our first campground, before we even started shopping for our first campground, uh, we developed uh, a basic model for a campground remote management company that we call Beyonder Camp. Um, so Beyonder Camp manages our campgrounds. That's what we designed it to do is manage the campgrounds that Happy Camper Capital uh, acquires. Um, however, we're actually building systems out now that we realize are scalable and transferable. So we are in the process of um, opening that up to third party management for other campground operators. Uh, we've got a great director of operations who joined our team a little while back who is heading that ship. Um, she's absolutely doing a great job right now. So uh, we're ready to put more on her plate and open that up. But our primary mission of Happy Camper Capital is to service our own campgrounds. Um, this was a, a, a former mission statement that encapsulates both Happy Camper and um, Beyonder Camp, which of course is, and this really follow, I mean, that we, we live up to this, you know, that our mission is to build multi-generational wealth, unforgettable guest experience and legacies worth leaving. Um, I'm going to hone in on that multi-generational wealth part at the beginning that I think is so crucial for us is, you know, when Justin and I launched into this, um, you know, we, we had this idea that we wanted to help other people, our friends, our family, many of whom weren't accredited investors um, come up. You know, so we, we really made it this set our focus on making our opportunities 506B, um, you know, here in the States. So just that we could allow non-accredited investors to come in, of course, with the mission to help them build their net worth and, and get that accredited status. So that's still something we live by. Um, every opportunity we can, we will have our op opportunities open to um, non-accredited investors through 506B, as long as, of course, they're sophisticated. But um, something important I figured worth mentioning. Of course, you, you met the three of us. Uh, myself, Justin, and Don make up our executive team. Uh, we have several other team members involved in acquisitions and investor relations um, who aren't on with us tonight. Uh, there, a couple of them are traveling. Um, a couple of them are working on some big projects right now. So we've got some opportunities coming, but we've got a few other gentlemen on the team with us. Um, so just kind of share what we do. Um, I know we were on the Mata Partners uh, video before. We talked a little bit about you know, it's the syndication model that we use, but I'll just kind of hit on the key points of that again, of course, um, in our model, which is that you know, first and foremost, we're an acquisitions group and a private equity group. Um, we are you know, bringing uh, property owners and our investors together to consummate these deals. Um, you know, th this space has gotten really crowded. Um, a lot of people are getting into the outdoor hospitality space. Um, you know, a lot, some, some are one-off owners, a lot of institutional 
investors are bringing their money into the space. Um, so it's definitely become challenging to find properties that are listed through brokers. Uh, we really hang our hat on the way in which we get in front of them. Um, you know, we're we're big fans of getting right in front of the mom and pop owners and uh, you know negotiating with them to get offers or to get our offers put together. Uh, we find that we've had better success doing that. We aren't competing with everybody else. Um, you know, the space, the, the prices are definitely getting jacked up. The cat rates are absolutely compressing right now. So we handle everything from, uh, we, we, we really pride ourselves in being able to find our own off-market deals as much as possible. We still do keep our relationships open with brokers, uh, but we are finding these. We've got our own um, fairly proprietary underwriting methods. Um, I'll let Justin shed a little light on those here shortly. But, uh, you know, we've got, yeah, these are definitely more complicated assets than um, other real estate investment products out there. So definitely a lot of moving parts that go into your business planning and the acquisitions process on those. Uh, just to be very clear, uh, I, I want to put this out there because we do get a lot of confusion on this. We are buying hospitality properties. Uh, these are vacation destinations or what we're targeting. So we are not buying mobile home parks. Uh, we're not targeting the RV parks that are like mobile home parks where it's just people living full time and they're living in an RV. Um, there's a lot more room uh, for improvement in these businesses when they are transient, which is the population we go for, just meaning they say 30 days or less. A lot more revenue centers we can add, a lot more things we can do to optimize the rates and really improve the returns on these things as we go through. Um, you know, just to kind of hit a um, high level on this, um, you know, so there are a few main types of RV destinations. Uh, there's some that are designed for very short stays, overnights. These are typically the ones you're only going to because you're too tired to keep driving. You're gonna be gone by the morning. There are the long-term ones like I spoke about that are almost like mobile home. And then there are the destinations and the destinations are where we really focus. And we've also added marinas into that umbrella. Um, and mar marinas as you know, with, with RVs on site um, fit our model. Um, it's that vacation destination um, you know, with added amenities. So those are the types of properties we're seeking. Um, you know, I, I'll hit on some high level stats and then I kind of want to, I want to turn it over to Des uh, Justin and Don to talk a little bit about our management model, a little bit about, you know, what we look for in these and what some of the opportunities are. But, you know, some of the reasons we like um, RVs destinations is they're nearly recession resistant. Uh, typically the folks who own RVs, you know, aren't living paycheck to paycheck. And, you know, a lot of them are retirees, um, although that's not the majority actually, but a lot of our retirees um, who are in a position where they're able to travel, some of them are full timers. So, you know, they, they always need to be on the road. It is their house. Um, but we do have a large uh, user group in the millennial and the Gen Z space who are coming in right now. Um, I've got my own speculation as to why I think they're so big in the space and why so many of them are full timers at such a young age. But point being, they, they're some of the largest users or owners and users of RVs right now. Um, so just letting us know, obviously, that this is not something that's dying out with the older generation as they move on. Um, you know, the, the cap rates have been high, although they are compressing. Um, you know, the demand has shot up. We've seen the cap rates compress uh, significantly over the past couple of years that we've been in this. Um, we've got potential for really fantastic cash flow in these properties in the way we've uh, projected them and, of course, in our business planning. Um, and like I said, the, the demand is increasing. And like Justin hit on at the beginning, um, these are just fun properties. You know, these are these are things we can go out and use. You know, Justin's planning a tour at the end of the month of our properties. He's going to go out and take his kids and they're going to go spend some time. Uh, my wife and kids are planning to do it uh, coming up here in the next month ourselves, get out to couple of our properties and go visit those. So a lot of fun properties. Um, Justin, I, I kind of want to pass it over to you. So I'm not the one stealing the whole show. If you, if, I, I'd love to kind of get your way in on kind of some of the things we look at when we're buying these and some of the underwriting principles we use and just, you know, kind, kind of some of the business funding that you've been heavily participant in doing. Sure. All right, guys. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll kind of follow this slide a little bit. Um, the, the RV parks, uh, you know, I'll go back to a little bit of the beginning and that, uh, two years ago, give or take, uh, you'd find RV parks in 11 to 13 cap range. And, um, you know, it's like, whoa. So, uh, the, the problem with that two to five years ago was that the parks would, uh, be something that you'd have to hang on to for a year, maybe even more in order to, uh, liquidate that. And so that wasn't a, an opportunity that I was really looking to take at the time. And then um, the last couple of years has really come down. So so now when we look at parks, you know, you're, we're finding anywhere from seven to nine percent. Uh, and of course, it's a little bit dependent on the, the full asset. 
Um, underwriting becomes a little bit difficult in this space uh, compared to multifamily in that uh, multifamily has a much broader uh, comparison model for uh, hyper-focused areas. So say Denver, for example, you can say, well, I know that I can buy a, uh, you know, an apartment building and I'm going to get a uh, $1,000 for a one bed or $1,300 for a two bed. And, um, you know, it, it kind of is what it is, uh, more or less. Um, RV parks really focus on um, the location. And we do look nationwide with mostly the exception of California. And uh, when we're looking at parks, we're looking at um, a, a lot of different variables, like the condition of the park, uh, where it's located exactly, uh, what might be the draw for people, what types of sites there are, is there electric, water, sewer, all three, what amenities are there, uh, is there a pool, is there a pond, a lake, a river, uh, what kind of rentals, is there a, a store, is there a uh, restaurant, so as you can tell, it kind of really gets uh, very uh, watered down with um, with with where all the income can come from, and um, and so the underwriting becomes a little bit difficult. Uh, we've made our own spreadsheets that take into a lot of different areas of income, and uh, you know pivot tables have become an important process <laughs> for us. Um, and so when we look at, at that as a group uh, in involve involving in the park the um, current income and expenses. So uh, a lot of times the number one line item is payroll. And since this industry has been some uh, mom and pop uh, historically, the, the owners or sellers will have been very uh, integrated into the park and not taking payroll. So it's another area to focus on. And then electricity, another major expense for a park especially when uh, it most, at least historically, it's been included in your uh, stay and rent, uh, mostly exceptional to the long-term tenants like monthly or seasonals. Um, so we take, we take all that into account and there's a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, software being probably the biggest opportunity that we see. Uh, the, the industry is taking away of the hotel hospitality industry. And, and am I jumping ahead a little too far, Adam? Nope, you're good. Okay, all right. So, so you know, kind of following the the business plan with that, you know, is the is the software aspect. So we can take uh, rates, and no longer is it a twenty five, thirty five, whatever it is, dollar per night stay. Depend, you know, whatever night it is, it could be a Monday night, a Saturday night, a July fourth, whatever it is, and uh, and now we can truly uh, evolve the rate planning on this and kind of like the hotel industry when you when you go online you don't know how much you're going to pay for a hotel you go on and it'll say you know one day might be 89 dollars and the next might be 110 and it is dependent on the reservation statuses of the property and it's dependent on the time of year so a huge revenue generator uh the um the other areas of course rentals uh you know cabins you know how can we improve the property and created that destination product that we also desire. Um, I like to say, you know, what is the Instagram post of the park and uh, how can we make it something that people are gonna uh, wanna share with the others and have a great time at. Uh, when we look at the financing aspect of things, the, the, the industry is a little bit different. They don't necessarily uh, look at DSCR as, uh, as importantly in the multifamily space. Uh, they're they're looking for uh, just a little bit higher down payments. So a lot of the a lot of the lending uh, bank financing is in the twenty five to thirty percent uh, area as a minimum. Uh, we were about a year ago looking at around the twenty percent level, and then the current environment has changed that a little bit. Uh, and then a lot of times you can also find a lot of seller carry options. Uh, we we do have a couple in the works right now where the sellers look to be carrying and. Um, that provides a great opportunity as well, um, where it doesn't, doesn't require the length of time that it takes to, to purchase the park. Um, yeah, so Adam, then maybe that's a cue, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's quite all right, Justin. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I think Justin uh, maybe 
I'll, I'll just expand on one of Justin's points a little bit, which is one of the big opportunities that we love about this is the opportunities to generate more revenue in these campgrounds are almost limitless. I mean, they're, they're really only bound by your imagination in some of the things you can add to these properties. Um, I've got a great story that I like to share just about our, our very first property we bought um, in Eastern Iowa. Um, you know, we had a business plan in place. We were following it. Uh, we were at a sporting goods store picking up some life jackets that we needed for, you know, our, our pool and beach area. And, you know, we got the, the idea. We went off script momentarily and we, we picked up some stand-up paddle boards. You know, we knew we love stand-up paddle boarding and we knew it was popular. But uh, we picked up two stand-up paddle boards, simple, small purchase. Um, we put them in our pond and for the first 24 hours, nobody used them because then we realized pretty quickly that people in Eastern Iowa probably hadn't heard of stand-up paddle boarding yet. So, you know, we got out there on, on them ourselves and we put our kids out on them. And next thing you know, they were rented out constantly and we had them paid off in about six weeks. So, you know, they've been a cash flow generator ever since. And it's just, like I said, we go in with pretty elaborate business plans. And sometimes it's these little things you think about these little tweaks, you know, we've got, we're coming up, we're exploring options right now for creating um, off season income in seasonal campgrounds when they're otherwise shut down. So having, you know, Christmas uh, attractions that people can come visit and be able to produce extra income that way. So lots of opportunities, um, you know, whereas in kind of the multifamily space, you're, you're pretty quickly limited by, you know, you know, certain thing, uh, upgrades and improvements, you're going to hit your max rent at some point, you know, you might create some extra revenue generators, like a, a trash service, or, you know, uh, putting your coin op laundry in, but eventually you're going to run out of those two. And I feel like we haven't yet found our threshold in the uh, outdoor hospitality space. Um, Don, I kind of want to turn it over to you. If you could uh, I, I, mm -hmm. give us your input on the uh, management side and, and the under side, and I'll let you take it. Yeah, certainly. So uh, Adam mentioned it at the very beginning. We have our, our uh, we'll say sister company, Beyonder Camp, uh, that was designed primarily to uh, manage our own acquisitions, but uh, we'll soon be transitioning as well to be able to manage uh, third-party campgrounds for, for other campground owners. Um, so essentially what, what we do is kind of what Justin hit on as well is that uh, you know, we provide that uh, that software uh, systems in place to provide the uh, online reservations with that dynamic pricing to uh, to modify those those uh, rental spaces as those as they get more filled up to uh, to op optimize the the returns on on uh, each property. Uh, with that as well, of course, that people we have in place that are running Beyonder um, oversee the 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 hiring of the staff and and people uh, the training of the staff at, at each campsite, um, you know, and as well as the the bookkeeping services and. Uh, pretty sure everything that's needed to, to run a, a, a campground. Um, you know, unlike, you know, again, man, uh, property or multifamily, uh, we don't just go out and hire a, a third party property management company to come in and just, you know, start renting out spaces. It doesn't quite work like that. There's a lot more involved to uh, uh, oversee all the day-to-day the -day, day -day operations and um, the multi multifaceted, you know, opportunities that are there, like such as, uh, like mentioned before, it could be a, a store, a restaurant, um, you know, both rentals or whatever maybe so there, there's a lot more involved that needs to be uh, overseen and, and uh, um, make sure all those things are, are in place as well as when we do our uh, expansion on these campgrounds to add additional amenities um, you know beyonder will be help oversee the the uh, that those um, expansions and, and, and other developments are, are done uh, properly and on time and uh, even provide input for for things that they may think of that we haven't thought of uh, of what people in that place would want to see or what they need um, obviously of course we'd we would uh, help reduce the expenses uh, overall by uh, having everything you know in-house and in one place rather than uh, you know outsourcing all these different uh, things to separate uh, providers. Uh, and of course, above all, everything else is just uh, to provide that great uh, guest experience. We want you know everybody that comes and stays at our campgrounds to uh, enjoy the, their time there, enjoy the experience, to go out back and tell their friends and their neighbors to come back and say you know to talk about the, the great time they had at this certain location. Um, you know, and again, with, with Beyonder, it, uh, you know, it oversees all the, the daily operations. Um, you know, again, we, we provide the, the hiring and, and the uh, training of the, the staff and the managers for each campsite. Um, and then, of course, we, we oversee three different uh, you know, basic levels. You know, we call it the getaway, the resort, and, and of course, the marina. Um, you know, there's different levels, as mentioned, Adam mentioned earlier, between the, the RV, like say, overnight parks where people just, you know, camp and, and stay and, and leave. Uh, versus the, the getaways are kind of more of like a destination place to go and have fun. And then the, the upper level of that resort, uh, you know, where people are just, you know, this is where you're going to go and this is where you're going to go out and, and have fun and, and um, you know, go there for the amenities on site. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the Marine is a whole separate entity in itself that, uh, you know, people are for, for boating and, and other outdoor experience as well. Um, so, you know, for anybody that's 
wants to learn more and, and possibly mess with us, of course, that the, we, we encourage you to come in and learn more from our website, happycampercapital.com. Um, you know, we provide uh, various ways that people can invest with us. Um, you know, generally we do a, a one-off investment, uh, prop, uh, private property placement for each, uh, you know, property we syndicate individually. Uh, this gives, you know, people the, the option to invest in any specific one deal they like uh, or multiple deals that we may have in our works. Uh, currently, we do not have a, a fund uh, available that we that we uh, have people invest in and, and, and you know invest in all of our deals. Um, that's something we may look into at some point in the future. But uh, for right now, it's uh, you can just invest in, in individual uh, properties through a syndication. Um, and with that, of course, everything would be totally hands off for the investor. Uh, they're not there, you know, worrying about the the daily management or uh, you know if something doesn't quite work right. That's all of our job. Um, you know, as a, as an investor, you would just come in and be completely passive. Um, basically call it, you know, mailbox money. You just sit at home and, and get your, your returns from that cash flow. Um, you know, and then of course you participate in the appreciation. So at, at the exit point in five years, you would be also receiving a big portion of that uh, equity uh, that has uh, appreciated over time. Um, so, so you're getting, you know, the great cash flows in the meantime, plus a big equity bump at the very end when, when we, uh, you know, uh, dispose of that property. Um, and of course you can invest with either as your own personal uh, investment funds through your, your bank accounts, um, or through some entity as an LLC or trust. Uh, you can also use your self-directed IRA or, or, or 401k as well. So yeah, the, the, the first step of course is, you, you know, we want you to know us, we want to know you, we want to know who's investing with us. Uh, we prefer not just have any random people get on our website and, and uh, you know, throw money at us. Uh, it's not quite how it works. You know, we have a, a two-step approval process for any new registers on our website. Um, so we have to approve you and get to know you first. So, so please schedule a call with, with one of us or another member of our team uh, to get to know us and we get to know you and see how we can best help you uh, as far as your personal needs and what your ultimate goals are with your personal finances. Um, you know, once you have that in place, uh, the next step would be, would be to, uh, you know, when we have a new opportunity come up on our website, you'd be notified of that. Uh, then to go on there and to look at the documentation we have on, on, on this website. Uh, we most likely would do a webinar for that property as well, but you could come on and watch the webinar, listen to what we are going to do with it, with our whole plan. Um, and if you like everything you see from that, then you're obviously welcome to invest with us. And, uh, you know, it's very simple through our portal. You can uh, request to invest in a specific property, say how much uh, you want to invest in that. We typically have minimums. Um, and from there, you just, you know, fill out the paperwork, sign everything, and then, uh, you know, wire your funds into us. Um, and then from there, you just, you know, we start eating your the distributions most likely as the, the very first uh, quarter in that comes up, depending on when we close that property. Um, but if it's of course early on in, in the quarter, then you'd most likely be getting a distribution that very first quarter um, and then be quarterly from there. So yeah, check us out at happycampercapital.com is the place to go to, to learn more and, and, and to invest with us. Perfect, Don. Um, great information. And one thing I just want to, I want to hit on going back to Beyonder is just, and one of the reasons we're really proud of this model we've built is that like Don mentioned, not hiring a third party property management company, first off, part in part because there aren't very many in this space, um, none that are established that we've actually been able to contact. But the other side that I think is really critical to mention is we control the management company. Um, if you've ever hired a property manager for say, you know, a house or, you know, multifamily building, nobody understands the pain of vacancy like the owner, right? You know, they're, the, a third party manager is apt to leave your units vacant and, you know, they, they're getting their money any, anyway. Um, when we own our management company, we they they are following the same mission we are. Now, of course, they know that we're going. We know that we're going to get the highest returns when we're getting the highest guest satisfaction. So that is a primary concern of theirs is guest satisfaction. But they know that we are looking to generate high cash flow. So they're focused on really being in relationship with that P and L. They're also knowing that we're that we're focused on the upside. So they're really focused on improving that property value over five years. Um, I think it's a huge benefit um, to our investors just that we've got total control over the deal and we aren't um, delegating any of that off to a third party company. So as Don mentioned, um, if you're interested in learning more about what we do, please check out our website, happycampercapital.com. Under the investor section, like Don mentioned, you can uh, request to join our investor portal. Um, you know, Don or, or one of us on the team is will reach out to you, of course, afterward, like he said, um, part of this, just because we have opened this up to everybody uh, accredited and non-accredited, we do have to verify everybody before they come in uh, to at least, you know, assess for some level of sophistication before we can let you in. But that gets you an opportunity to go in and actually see what we have going on in there, see any opportunities we have. Um, you know, we'd love to talk with you more. Um, we're excited about this asset class. It's really something we're passionate about. 
Um, so yeah, we, we would absolutely love the opportunity to um, speak with more members of the group and uh, you know build a relationship going forward. So uh, we do have some time left for any questions that have come up um, in the meantime. Uh, Matthew, I don't know how you want to handle that or- yeah, Absolutely. So if you guys yeah. want to unmute yourself, ask questions, maybe talk about like your exit strategy, like what's the cycle and, and stuff like that in, in, in the type of project you guys are investing. You know, I'm sure that's a question that, that people have. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, kind of elaborate on that since that's more of an underwriting thing. But the, um, you know, we're looking for properties that, uh, you know, first of all, have great opportunity. Second of all, have the uh, cash flow necessary to sustain the payroll. As I mentioned, the that's one of the biggest line items. And, um, and so we need to make sure that uh, it's going to be something that can be run remotely from an on, on site uh, park manager. So with that, you know, we're looking at parks that uh, are kind of a minimum of 100 spaces. Uh, there's other opportunities that can, you know, if, if it's a little bit less, um, you know, one of the opportunities we're working on is a marina, um, a little less um, RV sites, you know, so it really does depend on the cash flow, first and foremost, but the, um, you know, the, the, the price point where we're moving that price point up, you know, we're, you know, two and a half or more, we'd like to see at least five or more, 5 million more or more in a purchase price. And um, we're just really accelerating our growth. Um, you know, one of the, um, you know, one of the best opportunities, of course, you know, the, the kind of the more doors you have, the more opportunity you have to increase revenue. Right. So, um, so all of our smaller opportunities, we have to make sure that we have the proper um, expansion opportunities within the within the space. Awesome. Anybody have, have questions to ask the guys? Unmute yourself and uh, just ask away. I have one question. Ryan McIntyre here. Sorry if I cut somebody off. <laughs> um, and, uh, I, are Canadians able to invest in this uh, the, the RV camp world in the States? <laughs> I believe so. I mean, Matthew's probably more of an expert on that. I mean, none of us are, are Canadian to know exactly the, uh, uh, you know, the, the legalities of that. But um, I know that people do invest in the U.S. from Canada. I'm not sure the, all the steps that are needed for that. Um, Matthew, maybe you can help. Uh, so you, that, you, you, could, you could, in theory, invest directly if you want, but you're going to be, you know, double tax on it. So I would just uh, talk to your account, create a, the proper structure. Um, yeah. And, and, and just funnel your money down uh, that way. That's going to be the easiest way. Um, okay. But absolutely, absolutely don't invest directly. Just create yourself a structure, uh, but definitely yep. talk to an accountant. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, Philip Wallace here. You guys hear me? Yep. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, um, my question would be, uh, why wouldn't I just do this on my own? Why... What is the necessary advantage of being in the group? Thanks. Well, you can you can absolutely do this on your own. A lot of people do. Um, it's just doing this on your own becomes a job. Um, and, and this industry is very, very uh, heavy on labor. So um, uh, you could foreseeably go buy a campground and you could put a manager in place and remote manage them. Um, yeah, that's if that's within your purview and what you're looking to do and within your scope, that's I, I would encourage you to do it. Um, it is a lot of work. I, I, we will just say that there, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of continued operation. We have a full time employee on in Beyonder Camp who oversees our campgrounds and she's busy uh, just and she she's not even on boots on the ground. She's just higher level leading a manager that we have installed in the in each campground. So um, it's it's definitely laborious. Um, you know, the, I guess the, the investor we target is the person who does want the hands off experience. You know, they want to they, they want to own something that, you know, could potentially produce high cash flow that has you know a high upside potential and they don't want to have to do anything in the day to day. So typically people who have more money than time um, you know, are, 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 are ideal investors, but we do have some who like the space and just maybe don't understand it yet. Thanks, Adam. You bet. Hey, um, how does uh, depreciation work with uh, these type of properties? Good question. So, uh, Justin, actually, I, I should let you handle this, but I, I jumped in first. Um, <laughs> I'll just kind of, I'll give the high level and Justin can expand that if I don't explain it well enough. Um, we do have opportunities to depreciate uh, these. Obviously, these are more land than fixtures and assets. Um, so there are limits to what we can depreciate and there are different schedules. 
Uh, we tend not to have a, a full bonus depreciation year one, even though that's actually going away for everybody anyway. Um, but we do have uh, the opportunity on a five and 15 year schedule, I believe. So Justin, did I cover that or do you want to expand on that? I'd say that's pretty accurate. I mean, we can do a cost seg on these properties at the current moment, and that does provide additional uh, depreciation. Um, we we do have to be careful on the expansion side, at least uh, according to our CPAs, that um, it might not be in the best interest to do that right away. Uh, but there is a lot of asset on the property, depending on which one. Um, you know, Marina has a lot of boat docks. Those are easily accessible for cost seg. Uh, the main big structures like your store and, and restaurants types of assets are, but, uh, but with that, you know, full, full uh, disclosure is not going to be as big as a, uh, as an apartment building um, per se. Great. Thanks for the response. You're welcome. Anybody else have questions? I do, I do see one um, in the chat about opportunities in Canada. Um, you know, we are US based currently. Um, we, we did uh, see a deal in BC recently that we uh, would like to look at. Um, we are interested in the opportunity. I'll just say that we're not experts in that field yet uh, or in that country yet. So, um, so we do expect to, to expand, uh, but currently uh, our opportunities are, are stateside. I have a question. Hope they can hear me. Am I loud enough? I'm sorry. I have a tendency to be yeah, quiet. Yeah, we hear you. Okay. We can hear you, yeah. I have a little bit different twist because I am looking for a property for myself, one I to live on. And I've seen a couple that are interesting, but made me realize maybe I need to sit in some of these so I understand more. Um, I found like a property with a couple of, it needs to be income generating. So I found a property with a couple of houses on it, but it also has some RV spots. I personally, my twist, I need to do something with animals. I want a barn with maybe horses. And what I've learned in the horse community is that there are tons of people who travel about the country with their animals and need a barn, uh, need a place to put the horse as well as a place to pull up with their RV. Perfect, except <laughs> having, I oh, now last summer, I'm not totally coming blind to this. I had to stay in an RV over the summer with my own animals. So I saw the lady manager running all over the property. She, one of the things I noticed is they had um, an older couple that ran the site for her during the summer. And I just assumed, and I think from what I heard from other guests, that they kind of give them their lot for free for the summer so that they can manage it. Now, I'm not sure if they get paid additionally for that. Couple of questions. Is that what you do on maintenance? How difficult is it? I'm not trying to take on a hundred spots. I mean, you're talking 10. I'm not necessarily afraid if I found a property with enough land on it to add a couple of RV spots. How difficult is it to bring utilities so that I could have additional spots? And thirdly, since you all mentioned you had a management company, is it a potential where I can be guided from you guys so that I could not make any mistakes out the door and waste any of my lenders money? So saying that I can do this and be realistic about it. I'm not chasing apartments or a hundred units. Like I ironically have found a couple of properties that fit that model. Well, I'll jump in first on that. Um, so there is a huge demand for equine uh, RV spaces. Um, we've had, we've seen it in the States, uh, the ones that do offer it can command an easy double the nightly rates that a, a normal campground in the area would um, for just providing a round pen and just some of the amenities that you know people would want who are traveling with horses. So um, first and foremost, um, if you've got the right location, that could be a great opportunity for you. It's something we haven't expanded into yet. Um, I'm sure we will at some point. Um, as far as some of your other questions go, um, you know, as far as I guess you, you, had, you asked a few of them in there um, about adding sites, expanding. Um, the biggest challenge we run into when it comes to adding sites really is just getting the proper permitting, uh, the entitlements in place to be able to develop those. Working with the local governments, um, at least here in the States, so most local governments are friendly to hospitality. 
Uh, they want tourism. So it's a lot easier to develop um, additional transient RV sites than it is, say, mobile home, uh, which is nearly impossible to get granted anywhere or, you know, any sort of other, you know, long term living that they could see as being a problem for them. So, um, you know, it, there's it, it, a lot of hurdles to jump through to do that. Um, so if you're, you know, depending on that income, that could be a challenge. But again, I don't know local laws in Canada with the, what that's like for development. Um, I imagine it's probably at least equally as restricted as the states. So, um, you know, I, I guess that's that's first and foremost. Um, and then to answer your last question, uh, we'd absolutely be um, interested in talking about consulting or anything we can do to help you uh, launch. Um, you know, we, we love to share information. So, you know, feel free to jump on the website and reach out. Um, you know, we can, and we're actually developing a course right now uh, to help people buy RV destinations. Um, there's only one resource out there, one educational resource out there when we got into the space uh, by Frank Rolf and Dave Reynolds, who are big mobile home guys. Uh, they developed a course on buying RV destinations or RV parks, and they meant RV parks. They meant places where people are living. And it's, you know, their, their, their tools only got us so far. We actually had to develop a lot of our own underwriting systems. So that, hence the course I'm creating, which is designed for the more transient and hospitality space. So yeah, we'd be happy to talk with you offline about that. And, and to elaborate a little bit too, the, the, um, free space, uh, opportunities that that has changed significantly uh, over the past year. Uh, COVID, I would say, is the main reason for that. Uh, the um, and it's also a, a CPA uh, question too on how to accommodate for this. And, and ultimately, we had to change our opportunities for our uh, employees because we needed to make them employees and to do it right and legally. So uh, we give get discounts for our sites. Um, but you you run across sites uh, or spaces all the time that are giving free rent for um, people to stay and uh, help manage the park, whether it's uh, front desk support or maintenance, et cetera. Um, there's work camper sites. It's literally called work camper with a K. Uh, and so um, there's still those opportunities for people, but the, it's been a lot harder to find employees and, and the right people to to stay in these parks and and do what we see as necessary um, a smaller little operation I think would be maybe more opportunistic for that type of situation but I can uh, see that yeah yeah okay yeah and, and I could I could spend a half an hour talking about why you should pay people as opposed to just giving them the site for work there's a lot of legal and liability reasons as to why we we choose to do it the way we do um, but you know, teach teach their own. I, depending on the size of your operation, that's something you might fly under the radar on. We just can't take that risk with our size and with our investors behind it. No, that makes sense. And to be honest, I didn't like the maintenance people, so I get why maybe <laughs> you should pay them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, I got a quick question. Uh, how do you guys deal with you know guests and? Um, them booking a spot. Do you guys have like one site, you know, one website that has all different properties under that? Do you guys, is it, you know, every property is different and you know, how do, how do guests know about new properties? Like, how does that all work? Great question. Um, yeah, so online reservations are the, I mean, that, that was our sil silver bullet a couple of years ago. You know, everybody else has kind of signed on with it now and is starting to bring it in. Uh, a lot of the old mom and pops used to have a, a cork board on the wall, and that's how they kept their reservations. You had to call in and talk to them, and they'd write your name and put it up on the wall. And, you know, you, you couldn't make a reservation any other way. And I just told you a little bit ago that our highest user group right now is millennials. Well, how many millennials do you think are going to call on the phone? They would probably rather drive their RV off a cliff than call somebody and actually have to talk to them. So um, if you don't have online reservations, you're you're falling behind. Um, so we find uh, that's a, that's an easy a 5%, you know, boost in your camping revenue, um, just having online reservations. And then you add in the yield management or dynamic pricing that just talking about, that's another boost yet. So huge opportunity there. Um, we are centralizing all of ours under our Beyonder brand um, on our Beyonder Camp website. So it's more or less a one-stop shop. Um, KOA and a couple of the other big um, names out there have done similar things. Um, you know, we're, we've got our own version of it, but uh, yes, um, yeah, having them in one place, having them uh, pouring into your SEO and, you know, just making these things visible, holding events, you know, being present on social media. I mean, that's, that's the best thing you can do to get the word out and let people know about the brand, uh, about the events you're holding, about the fun properties you have. Awesome. Of course, we want, to, we want to attract those, those uh, Instagram people that are going to come there and take pictures and post it out on social media for everyone else to, to see and follow and want to come there as well. 
What about, uh, would you guys uh, be, you know, do an app? Do you have an app? Uh, we, we had talked about it at one point, uh, you know, I, I, I'm of the personal thought anyway, and I could be wrong that I, I need another app. Like I need a hole in my head. Um, I feel like everybody's got an app for something nowadays. Um, you know, most of the people who are looking for these campgrounds just, and this is from somebody who's experienced RVing, um, Justin, maybe you can echo this. Um, you know, when you're on the road and you're looking for a place to stay, typically you're turning to Google or one of those, you know, services to, you know, Apple maps, which uses Yelp, you know, to, to look for a place to stay. Um, so that's how most people are going to come in contact with us. Now, having an app could be a way to create some loyalty. Um, we have not gone down that road yet. So not to say we wouldn't do it. Um, it could be a great opportunity and maybe in the future for us. Yeah. Cool, thank you. No, thank you. Well, I got a question. Uh, here in Canada, we got uh, something called winter. And uh, I don't know, I don't know, uh, I guess I'm curious, like, what uh, are you guys doing? Uh, I don't know if you're buying somewhere where there's winter, like Colorado or something like that, but to optimize the winter month and uh, in terms of revenue, and uh, is there an opportunity there for a park that don't operate in winter? There's a lot, there's pluses and minuses uh, to that. Yes, we're looking uh, in the Northeast very regularly. We have not secured one there yet. The Midwest is also, uh, not the best winter location, but really the, the seasonality is where the bulk of the money comes from. Uh, so when you, when you look at a property that's only open, say, May through October, uh, you're still buying on the cash flow. So you're just compressing a lot more cash into those six, seven months versus the whole year. So, uh, you know, it's not as uh, regular as a uh, southern state opportunity, you know, but, but you're still bringing in a similar uh, cash flow projection overall is just budgeting and appropriately uh, holding on to some reserves through the winter. Uh, the staffing aspect of that is a little bit more difficult uh, in terms of you're not having someone stay there. So uh, so when we look at our parks, we're, we're hopefully looking for opportunities to keep it open year round. And that usually involves uh, the change in the water, uh, putting up the proper uh, receptacles to uh, frost-free um, solutions so that they won't freeze and uh, and then heated tape kind of thing. So uh, like in, in Iowa, for example, about uh, I would say 20% of our park is open year round. Uh, there are some mobile homes on that. So it just really depends on the give and take of the property and how you can run it. And uh, just having a little bit of extra cash flow through the winter uh, and keeping someone on site uh, becomes pretty important, but I wouldn't say it's a necessity. Um, of course, the the opening and closing uh, on on the shoulder side of that is a little bit of a hurdle, but um, just it just is an understanding ultimately. Yeah, I want to expand a little up. bit. Oh, sorry, Don. <laughs> yeah, I might, might might be saying what you're going to say, but I was going to say that it also opens the door for for other opportunities to look into to, to find ways to create revenue during those winter months. Um, they, Adam talked on it earlier about the, a possible uh, you know. Christmas decoration drive-through, uh, you know, opportunities that can be done there. Um, you know, also look into just some some traditional RV storage that people need a place to put it during winter. You know, so there's there's still other opportunities to look into to create additional revenue stream during those winter months, even if it's not being fully used as a, a campground per se. Yeah, and, and just to really kind of hammer home on what Justin was saying. So first off. I haven't seen a campground yet that ha doesn't have seasonality. Even the ones in the Sun Belt states um, have seasonality. They have their peak seasons, their off seasons. And you're, you know, and as Justin said, of course, you're buying these on a capitalized approach. So it's based on the cash flow. So yeah, if that whole, if all your cash flows compress into six months, um, I actually get excited about that because that means we have more opportunity now. I can look for ways to open the campground a couple weeks earlier, keep it open a couple weeks later than the former owners have been doing, find other revenue streams to bring in, in the winter time. I mean, anything I'm doing there is just going to really affect our cash flow and our upside on this. So um, I, I'm not scared of the seasonality. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll find ways to, to make more money. Uh, you know, we get creative. And like, you know, Justin contacted somebody recently who gave him the idea, as Don mentioned, about the, uh, the Christmas light drive through. So you've got, you know, a mile of roads in your campground that are otherwise not used. People are willing to pay money by the car load to drive through and see cool shows. And then we can rent out the parking lot for Christmas tree sales. So there are some opportunities to generate revenue in this that, like I said, they're only bound by your imagination. 
And if we're close by to a place that has like some, some skiing options, we still tend to have cabins on site that we still rent for like short-term rentals. People want to come stay there and go skiing, you know, so uh, there's still other options to, to go on during winter. Awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Awesome information, guys. Any, anybody else have some questions before we wrap it up for tonight? Don't be shy. Unmute yourself. I just want to say thank you guys for having us on. Um, it's been an honor talking to you guys. We love talking about this stuff. Um, you know, we're happy to take these conversations offline. Um, so if you want our, all of our calendar links are on our website. If you want to schedule a call with any of us, um, you know, we, like I said, this, this is what we, we get to play for a living is, is really the way we look at this. So we're happy to share this information with you guys anytime. So grateful for having us on with you. Awesome guys. So thank you so much again. And, uh, you guys will have the replay uh, via email and uh, we'll see you guys at the next event. So thanks again for coming on guys. Take care.